Anthony Bromley. I'm a bloodstock agent um, that covers a multitude of sins. Um, racing manager, syndicate manager, um, advisor to owners, trainers, trying to find racehorses that win races for people, flat and jumps. So my grandparents had a stud farm in Shropshire and then my father took that on after that. So they had jump stallions in, in rural Shropshire, Space King and um, we had classic cliche with dad and Scottish Reel and some of the Chiefly Park horses came there as well. Um, uh, so Harry Lewis was, was a champion jump sire there as well. So, but dad, dad retired about 10 years ago. When I did my A-levels, went to work for David Minton as a sort of tea boy and sort of made myself useful in his office, pedigree research, catalogue work, uh, helping him around. And, uh, and he sort of took, you know, he took people on like that for a few months, but I, I ended up staying. Um, he saw something in me anyway. Um, and he sort of took me more under his wing than many of the youngsters that had been through his hands. And the stud side of it was more my sort of thing. I wasn't a rider, so we went down the line of getting some work experience at some of the top studs in the world. So I went to Chiefly Park Stud, uh, Shadwell Stud, and um, Lane's End Farm in Kentucky. But ultimately, it was always coming back under Minton's wing at the end of that. And um, there wasn't one day you suddenly said, oh, I'm an, a Bloods occasion today. It was probably over a period of two years that uh, you gradually found that you weren't being sent to Ascot Sales to, to meet one of Minty's clients. Someone was ringing the office wanting me to find something. And it, it sort of, it was a period of time and it, suddenly you realized you were, people were asking you to find the odd horse and stuff. And um, so yeah, so over a period of time I became a blood agent. It, there wasn't any qualifications. It was just legwork and looking at horses and listening to people and f asking questions. Yeah, a lot of that. It was quite frustrating in the 90s that the, the form horses were either you bought one off the flat at Newmarket at horse in training sales or privately um, or you had to go with a bumper or a point to point and point to points in the 90s in Ireland I don't think were very strong and wasn't, wasn't the, f the source so you were looking at bumper horses in Ireland which were very scary to be what they were paying for you know newcomer races so I was desperately looking for another angle and then Martin Pipe started buying these French horses and they started doing really well and were very precocious and there was big weight allowances for for youngsters for four and five year olds over fences and um, he paved the way he he he, he put the, put it up there and then we got in touch with David Powell in France who was someone that Minty knew from the 70s and um, we, we've got a great relationship going it took um, took a few years for me to really get people up for the idea and then suddenly it just took off and, and we did well with that. I'm not buying as many in France now so I wouldn't be as I mean I, you know, I'm not as I'm not over there as much as I used to be but that's there's not so much there's a few there's a few reasons for that but um, there's not so many for sale uh, and the prices are very high and I haven't got many clients that'll pay very big figures so a lot of it's sort of a waste of time for me you know I don't have many big, big uh, budget orders. So, and that's where most of the good, you know, that's where most, if, if a French horse is on the market, there's one at Otoy, he's out of my budget. So it's sort of not my, you know, most of my business is, is not at those fig really big figures. So I have to find where they are. And actually the last couple of years, I've been buying a lot of Irish point pointers. You know, there was Corto Star, Long Run, Masterminded, Big Bucks, Neptune Collange. Um, you know, there were some great, great horses. Buying those horses, it wasn't rocket science. I mean, basically you were buying horses with grade, grade one, grade two, uh, form already. Um, you just had to feel that there was more to come. You know, they could continue on. Um, and also find a man that would believe you and go for it um, and, pay the, and pay a good price for them. Yes, we were paying big figures for them, but they were very proven horses in my view. What you're finding now in France is those same figures, and then we're talking, you know, some of those were f between 300 and 500,000 euros. That's what you now have to pay for a once raced horse, and that's much riskier. And that's why I've been a little bit reticent. I, I said I'm not buying so many in France because you're going back to what we always had in Ireland anyway. So you, you, you're, you're going in with, with, you know, look, try and look through your fingers sort of thing. You haven't got much evidence to go on and that sort of scares me a little bit. And I, I'm, I'm a bit careful. I, 
you know, blood certification is careful with their clients' money is good, <laughs> but it's sort of, it is, whole, it is a bit of a handbrake because I'm not quite so happy spending really big figures, uh, you know, on a once race horse, and it does make me nervous. I don't think I'll, fi I'll find a, a better horse for a client, I suspect, because he was at the top for nine seasons. His longevity, it was his robustness, really, uh, is phenomenal to be playing at the top table for so long. He was, he was a smart three-year-old in France, but was getting beaten. Um, you know, he wasn't like an unbeaten four-year-old, but it, uh, a juvenile. But he just picked up that last spring and beat the best filly in France, who was, had been unbeaten. And he won a, a grade two, grade three race and suddenly announced himself on the scene. But it was like his 10th run and it was only his fourth win. Um, he'd been put in his place by that film all the way through her career. But until that moment, then he just suddenly sparkled that spring and he did look like on the upgrade. But he was already in the top three or four juveniles. That race popped him as, could he be the best four-year-old in France? Well, he was the best four-year-old gelding anyway. And... Um, it was just a question of getting him bought. And he was owned partly by the trainer and partly by um, Claude Cohen, whose colours he ran in. And it was a difficult uh, transaction. It wasn't easy to get them to agree. The trainer didn't want to sell it and he had a share in it, but his um, soon to be a, a divorced wife was looking to, 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 to get the assets um, uh, materialized. So she was full on for the sale and he wasn't. Anyway, we did get a deal agreed and we did get over there, but it was going to be tricky. So we all actually went, the French agent, myself, went with the vet because we thought we may need a, her a bit of help to get through this vetting because the training wasn't going to be helpful. And uh, anyway, everything, he was, he was sweetness and light. We couldn't believe it, you know, and uh, we, we thought it was a bit weird. Why have we all come? Because I kept saying to my French agent, I said, this fella's a lovely fella. Yeah, I can't quite work it out. He wasn't very nice on the phone before. So anyway, we, got, we did the track work, this and the other, and Buffy said, well, I'll just get him back home and we'll scope him as we do an endoscope larynx check. And uh, we got back to the yard. And anyway, he would not take the endoscope. And, and the fellow who was holding it was his, normally his race jockey as well. And he said, well, you'll never get that down. And we've never got that down in his whole life. He will refuse it. And he was rearing up. We were going to have, poor old Buffy was going to get killed in that box. And we had to sort of pull out. And she said, well, the only way we can do it is if we dope him. But the thing was, there was another race coming in about a week, 10 days. So you've got to get permission from the trainer to, if you're going to dope the horse, to, to be able to relax him, to just scope him. Well, then we couldn't find the trainer. After we'd done the track work, he'd gone. And he'd left his phone and he'd gone AWOL. And literally, his wife was going apoplectic. She sent runners out everywhere to try and find all these little watering holes and where he could be. He'd just gone off grid. Uh, so he couldn't get, you know, and we literally couldn't do anything. Um, we said, is there a lunging area so we could, you know, do his wind again or whatever. And, and there was no, they didn't have a lunging area. So anyway, we, we finished off the vetting, but we couldn't scope, which is a part of the vetting we, we, we'd really like to do. Anyway, that afternoon we had a long chat with Paul Nichols and with Clive Smith. And that evening we actually went back and confirmed the deal. Then the trainer went mad at my agent. He just absolutely lost it. He said, how can you possibly have bought it? I knew you wouldn't be able to scope it. I knew this, the deal wouldn't be, I can't believe this. How can you possibly buy it? I didn't think you'd buy him. And that's when he got all nasty, but it would have been all sweetness light until that moment. But they, to be fair to Paul and Clive, uh, they said, well, look, we've seen that video of him 10 days ago, absolutely bolting up. If you're, you know, let's go with it. You know, and, and that, was, that, that was good, you know. Um, I, w would I buy him now if we couldn't scope him? I don't know. don't know, because we've had lots more issues with wind since then, so I don't know. A vet is given a role to do, and whether or not that's a, a, a shorter vetting at the horse sale, um, or a full five-stage vetting, which can take up to a couple of hours. They, it's, they're obviously got to be careful on legal stuff, requirements. They need to list everything. What I like to try and say is to the vet, give them a little bit of, I said, look, we don't need full sets of x-rays, but if you've got any reason to think you should x-ray something, you, you've got permission to do so. But let's not look for problems that aren't clinically there at the moment. Um, we don't do full sets of x-rays. Uh, however, I do, we, we are now doing more as, as customary uh, uh, back x-rays. We're finding the breed now many horses have some kissing spines or very close uh, spines and and you will still take a horse with that but you just sometimes you just want to have all the information 
and then make your judgment. Now you need a vet that can give you all those details, but then you do ask the vet to give you a bit of a steer in a positive or negative way. And, and that's where you get, you know, a younger vet states all the stuff and, and it hasn't got that experience sometimes to be able to push you one way or the other and probably will err on the side of caution. So it is a very tough gig for a vet. He has to come in and give you a full thing. Now, there are plenty of horses that, as we all know, that have failed the vet and then have gone on to be very, very good. Now, you know, and I've got examples of, you know, uh, Min would be the horse that we didn't buy and I was buying him off his first run uh, or first or second run and he hadn't shown that much but we were buying him at like 90,000 euros or something and it looked like he had a very unstable soft palate and now and we didn't take him and that was, I always regret that because his next run he went and ran I think he won at, or, or was second to 0 and then his price went up and then he was bought and they and I don't think they had any problems with his wind but you know it but you're asking a vet to make a decision on that day and it was very unstable when she scoped it and we didn't take the horse it, there was always going to be one or two like you never go back on the ones that she told that the vet told you not to buy you never and then it never sees the light of day again you forget about those so you only go back at the ones which really turn out well I think um I think vetting's I think you need to still be open-minded about the vet report and you've got to take some things on board uh, at times. You can't, there's no such thing as a perfect vetting, not on a horse who's been racing and trained for a couple of years. You have to be a little bit open-minded, but that isn't easy. You obviously you have to, you know, there are risks attached. Um, my Will, years ago, Andy Stewart, was one of our early buyers in at McKez. Good horse, really good horse. And he had a really loud heart murmur on the, and I'm gonna say which side it was, I think it was the right side. And Buffy got herself quite worried about that. So she rang Celia Ma in, in, in Newmarket, it was about 20 odd years ago, I'd say now. And, uh, and she said, well, if it's right-sided, it's not so important as if it was a left-sided one. I think, that was, I think that's the right way around. <laughs> anyway, I had to ring Andy Stewart and say, look, you know, we've got quite a loud heart murmur on this horse, but he's, but he's unbeaten, he's won his two races. He's saying, and, and Andy said, well, it's all a gamble, isn't it? Every horse we buy is a gamble. Let's go for it. And I thought, I loved that. that he was a great owner. He, he, was, he said, it's all, it's all a gamble. Let's go for it. You know? And he was, a, he was that sort of way about it. And, and sometimes you want to have all the information, yes. But anyway, and like my will ended up being placed in the Grand National. So you know, that could have uh, that put any mantra stress on his heart and he was fine. So There's important horses in your career. Cortisol was a very important horse, yes. Um, Azerti was a very big horse early in the day from France. Caterino was the first really good French horse. And he was, and I, I felt quite close about that one. It was very early in the time I was buying the French horses and he won a Triumph Hurdle. He then won the Irish Champion Four-Year-Old Hurdle at Punchestown. And he very nearly won the French Champion Four-Year-Old in November uh, and got beat about half a length. So he nearly won the three grade one four-year-old races in that year. And then he went on still winning races for the Whaley Cohen's and for Sam riding them, two fox hunters at, at Aintree at age 12 and 13. That horse, I think would, when you ask me about a favorite horse, I think Katrina says a lot. And, I, and it was, and the Whaley Cone family, we go back that far and to see the horse then winning for, for Robert's son was, you know, amazing. And, and Noble Yates, which I bought you know, Noble Yates just eight weeks before the national this year for, for Sam's what ended up his final ride. It was going to be his final season, and and you know, and I said, like, "Is there anything with that?" I said, "Well, look, there's this horse that's run at Weatherby, and they've cleverly got him all on his sixth run, and he's handicapped to be a bit better than he is, and it's a bit of a risk because he's a novice chaser going for a national, but they are really training for it." And anyway, that was and that 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 was very special to do that for the Whaley Cohens, who have been clients with from way back, and to, to you know, and I know now having a son riding that there cannot be anything more fulfilling to to own your horse and your son ride it to win the, the biggest race in the, in the in the in the in the world really so uh, and but you see noble yates's vetting wasn't straightforward he'd had tw he'd twice had, had had vets report saying abnormal heart after a race last season and and the, it, and he does have a, a an odd irregular beat that comes into his thing and we we did all the checks management we took him into the clinic at the curra and we, we have a special machine on him, this, that, and the other. But um, Mark McRedmond was the vet, and he, he gave it, he, he did all the investigation and said, but I think you should go for it. And that's what you need a vet to say. It was very easy to fail that horse. 
but what a what a and when I soon and that driving home that night from Aintree, I did message Mark Redmond and and really thanked him and stuff like that because you know you forget about that deal would never have happened without that being a bit ballsy you know and go for it. it it's still early in his career so every ride I'm sort of riding it with him at the moment I mean I'd like to hope that if he you know be, continues to you know get going in the career that I won't have to be quite so nervous and worry about every single ride and how everything's going but I analyze every ride he's doing very closely at the moment so at the moment I'm uh, uh, I'm very drawn to, to watching how that's all going and how his career is developing. Um, he's very early in his career at the moment, but uh, you know he's ridden a few horses for me in point to point. He, he did four seasons point to point. He wrote me a lot of winners point to point, and there is no greater pleasure, I have to say. So I can see when Robert Whaley Cohen sees his son ride the national win in his colours. I, you know, I was ex I was thrilled just to see him win the Open point to point in our local uh, East Anglia. So I, it's it's unbelievable what that feeling would be. I quite welcome it with the Irish point of points because that does it gives me half a chance of competing for the for the animals but there are there are private sales being done in point of points but they are being done at a very high level so it's as I say it's probably above my pay grade a lot of it anyway the the vendors are obviously feeling that if you can get that um, uh, competitive tension at the sales auction it can really work for them and you know and, and, and they can really get some crazy prices because you get two people just won't give in so that's why the, that's why a lot of those horses are turning up at a sale ring because you just have that chance it could just go and re double what you think it could make um, it does it is you know I do enjoy the fact that the you know these boutique sales coming up every month and you get pretty much a you know, selection of 70 odd, 80% of all the recent point to point winners. And then you can choose which one you like or whatever, or which one you can afford. But it's, it's, they're good. it's a good marketplace. It's working well. They are proving to be a good source of strong winter stayers, you know, uh, winter jumpers. And um, the, the, the quality of horse going into the Irish point points now is so far and above what it was, say, 10 years ago, uh, 15 years ago. and and. It's the new system that, you know, they're trialing out all our, the horses for us, really, in the, in the point of points. And um, at the moment, you know, there's going to be a lot of Cheltenham Festival winners all come from originating Irish point of pointing. A lot of them are being French bred, but they've come through a different route now. They've been a lot of the a lot of the this is one of the things that is also hold me back a bit in France is so many of the young stock are being bought at foal yearling two year old stage and taken to Ireland for resellers stores. You know, you saw this last summer at the store sales, I think I counted 250 French bread stores at the auctions, at the main auctions. Now, they don't breed more than about 800 in France for jumping. I don't think there's a thousand bread for jumping. So you're taking out, and you're taking out, you might not be taking out the very best pedigrees, but you're taking out athletes because the Irish boys, they're buying them to resell, are buying an athlete, they're buying a, a racy looking horse, even if he hasn't got much pedigree. So. I think that's another factor that the, the, the base, the pyramid base in France is getting tighter at the bottom. So that's making it harder. You know, it, the, cre the very top horse in France is still a good horse, don't get me wrong. But I just think that I used to buy, make a, a, a very good business out of buying the horses just a bit below the top of that pyramid. The horses winning at a Fontainebleau or a Bordeaux or a La Teste, that they could be proper Saturday horses winning graded races. But those horses now, that level of that level in France is not that strong anymore. But your Otoy top horse is still up there, but um, and that's what's made it make um, that middle market in France because there's so many nice horses have come out, have been taken out and gone to Ireland, and then they come through the system that way. In Ergamine, he came through the English point to point, but he's French bred, bought as a store in Ireland, trained by Tom Lacey to win a, a Lark Hill point to point, and he's come that and gone back to Ireland to go into. So it's all more international. It's, there's a lot of different routes to it now. I buy a lot more stores than I used to, and we're you know for the double green colours they've bought a lot of stores in the last few years and built, making their horses through Crawford. A lot of those are French breads, but I've been buying them in Ireland. It's funny how it all goes. It's, it's an international thing. Uh, Minty and Minty and Nicky Henderson, I've learned from two of the best people I think stores and individuals so much so important. It, you've got to have an athletic, well-made model because they've got to take a lot of training now, and. Um, Look, if you, well, you also know that if you've got the model and you've got the pedigree, you've got a very expensive store. So, but I would sacrifice a bit of pedigree 
um, for the individual. Um, that's how Alan King and I have bought over the years with limited budgets. If, you've got, if you're on stricter budgets, I think I'd go more individual. But if you've got a higher budget, you obviously want, to, you want it all, don't you, really? Pedigree will out, hope, hopefully. Well, until a couple of weeks ago, Jeux saint Eloi was probably the French horse that no one had heard of, a saint des saints and now he's a sire of it's for me, and then he had another Irish winner, and, uh, and now it's only everyone's talking about this horse who never won a race in France, but it was placed at Otoy, but it was well-bred saint de saint no. So that was, he's, he's sort of not, he's certainly not a, um, an unknown now. Um, yeah, I don't think we use enough proven jumpers. We don't try and make our stallions from going jumping. We, you know, we, 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 you win an Ascot Gold Cup and you think, oh, you'll be a jump stallion. But our Ascot Gold Cups invariably run on very fast ground. We're actually breeding from, yes, group one uh, flat horses, but they aren't even proven soft ground horses, which that's a bit bonkers, really, if we think about it. Um, but the, the French do use a lot of proven jumpers. And I think that's really, you're getting, you're not getting just like, you're not putting a flatbread horse on top of a jumps mare. You're getting everything, you know, they're precocious. And a French jumper has to be a good three and four year old over jumps at Otoy in heavy ground, jump loads of jumps, because they'll have 50% more jumps in a two mile race than we do over here. And they're proper big jump. So they've shown precocity to come to hand at three and four. They've got Otoy form. That it takes out a lot of imponderables anyway. So I think there's a lot. I mean, so uh, I think I'm a big fan of Goliath de Burley. He's a new stallion in France. They would be, they might be two years old now. I'm trying to think, I don't think they're three. Um, you know, but there's a few of those stallions all coming through at the moment. There's Nivelle de Burley, Goliath de Burley, Moses Hass is going to come through. There's, um, there's, there's a lot of grade one Otoy jumpers with that have really bubbling under the surface at the moment in France. And I think they are interesting sires. Case style was, was a phenomenon. He was, uh, you know, extraterrestrial type of horse, you know. I always felt even back then, a horse will be at the top for three seasons at the top. Maybe a race for longer than that, but it, he's got three real big seasons. And that could be, with a French horse, that could be five, six, seven years old. And with an Irish horse, we used to sort of say, well, it's a seven, eight, nine, perhaps. I think you still only, you know, it's still a, a, a rule of thumb, three big seasons out of a horse is probably where you're at. Horses have to be trained very hard, very fit to, to do well in these great group, grade ones. And it's not, you know, there's no easy races anymore. So you can't have a few easy prep runs. You've got to be 90 odd percent every time you run. Um, so it is, you know, it, it, there's some big questions being asked. And I don't think, I think if you, it doesn't matter if you're German bred, French bred, Irish bred, whatever, you've, You've got those three seasons. It just depends when you when they come. The the affordability checks from the gambling review are going to really s push gambling into the black market. It won't feed through in the systems. This is a big big worry, and only we're only just it's it's now dawning on people now, and this is our funding mechanism, and that is it's not going to be fit fit for show in a moment, and it's such a shame, um, you know, and. And we're not a big enough industry to get enough big sponsorship in because we just we are a minority sport looking at a a middle to old age clientele. Um, yeah, we've got problems afoot in in British racing. It's it's the envy of the world in so many ways, and yet, but it isn't all about prize money. It is about prestige and winning the good races, and that's that's an important fact. The only the next problem we're going to have is if the, it, within a short period of time we could have no whip. And, that, and if we're the only country in the world got no whip, that'll soon lose our uh, status as one of the best in the world. And I, and I am deeply worried about those sort of issues. Um, obviously, the race courses don't get, their income stream is through getting people through the turnstiles, but there's gotta be a, they, they get it, they're pricing themselves almost out of it at the times you feel with the price of getting into these race courses, but that's how they get, make their income. And I know you're funded in Ireland so that you can make it lower to get in. Um, but I wonder if, you know, to get young people going again, you've got to get the price down. Um, I mean, it's great doing these, you know, a lot of the courses with a local university can do these university gigs, and that's a great way of getting them, catching them, <laughs> catching younger people then. But um, I don't know, there are some big problems afoot uh, uh, coming. We do lunge from crisis to crisis. All the years I've been in it, there's always a crisis going on. But we have got some problems to, to go. And, but we have got great, great, uh, international owners that want to have flat race horses in Britain and 
and you know and and they still all right a lot of the horses english owners have horses training in ireland but they want to come and race them in england at the big festivals too at royal Ascot on the flat and at cheltenham and aintree so we have got something very important to sell but we seem to be shooting ourselves in the foot too many times um, you try and make your own judgment quite a lot you know you watch the races you can now it's, it's brilliant you can watch the races almost on sunday night certainly monday morning um and you go to the and you're, it's it's you, i mean i'm doing my work around the sales because as i say 75 80 percent of them are all turning up within a couple of weeks at the sales so you get a feel for it all because you've been doing monthly through the through the winter and also there are they're the same characters. I mean, your Dennis Murphys, your Colin Bowes, the Monbegs. These guys are, tr are there at every sale. They're bringing winners to the sale, but they're trying to steer you the right way as well. I mean, yes, they want their they want their their big prices, but equally, they do want to steer the bigger buyers towards things that they think will make them, you know, make you want to come back to them. And um, but they do get good prices because they are good to, you know, they are they do try to steer you the right way um, on the better ones. I mean, it's it's a healthy market that Irish point to point scene. Um, they're, they're outbidding us for the stores initially. So we, we you know, so you follow some horses that you try to buy as a store, you, you get outbid by them, but you follow it because you know you like that horse. So as soon as it's run, you, you know, you're, you're interested in it. Glass ceilings keep getting broken, unfortunately, you know. <laughs> when, when John Bond broke the, you know, broke the half a million at auction, made 570, that was a glass ceiling that got broken. And suddenly then, because obviously there are, you know, they're wealthy owners, they can pay that if they, if they want to. But you don't want to be the first to do that, you know. And and then you know, John Bond made five seventy, and then was, was it Classic Getaway? Did he make five seventy or something? No, it was one of these. There was one within a you know a very short period of time. Went and did it again. I suddenly think, well, it's like London buses, you know. How on earth this happened? Um, it's just it's what perception is. Uh, it's a shame that a horse gets labelled with his price tag. It's, uh, it, and, and, I, and I know some owners don't like buying at public auction because of that, because you don't say the walk, you know, the walk in the park, uh, unbeaten uh, Irish pointer pointer, John Bond. No, it says no, the 500,000, pound purchase John Bond, and it, it, written every time. It's a descriptive part of his name now. And that is a shame when it doesn't work out, you know. Um, but now no one talks about that John Bond costs 570 because he's now done it in his own right. And that's great. But but there is a lot of press about if that horse gets beat they want to they 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 love to write it in again and you know the owners don't particularly want to have a public price written on all their horses so sometimes they do like a private sale no one knows exactly what they paid for a horse currently i'm, I'm very happy buying young stores in ireland trying to bring on horses for clients that route um and also buying irish pointers but i'm also keeping an eye on france at, at the middle level just if you can find something that's that's clever um, and, you, and you're always still looking a bit off the flat although that's not been uh, one of my main sources um, it's a bit risky because you're actually competing that market's very hot for middle distance flat horses now from from Europe because they do so well on the turf in uh, in Australia and Hong Kong want them and America want them and now the Middle East are after them and suddenly you're paying uh, way over a couple of hundred thousand for a flat horse that really you don't know will jump and and the pedigree doesn't say it doesn't shout jumping as well so it's a bit riskier so I tend to be if I'm paying those big figures I'd rather buy a horse who's obviously seen jumping um, it, it does seem bonkers that you're running for such low prize money but ultimately you're not doing that you're doing it to try to win the prestigious races at Cheltenham at Aintree at Punchestown and the, which are bigger prize money so it's only don't worry the, the bumper's worth two grand. It's, it's the means to an end. They've got to learn their trade and it's a build. And, 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 you know, if you get a top racehorse, they still can rack up some good prize money at the end of their career. The very top races are worth quite good money, but people aren't really, prize money is important, but it's not the be on and end all. Yeah. It is just trying to find the next clever one. It is, a, you know, and it, it, you, you do, I'm still driven to treat finding, yeah, to find that next Corto star. I do quite enjoy doing the flat at the moment. I've been doing quite more flat the last couple of years and been quite successful with it for Alan King, with True Shan and, and with Eve St. Johnson Horton, uh, Chipotle and Streets of Gold and, uh, and Jumbi won a group two last year. You know, and, but they're all horses that cost under 40,000. And that's 
for me, I'm getting a lot of pleasure from that because it, it obviously that isn't such big money in the flat and it's, it really is buying an unraced horse and it's your judgment on the confirmation and the pedigree and whatever. And, and, I, and I've, that's given me quite a kick the last few years and, I, and I'm wanting to expand that a bit more and, and see if we can win some more group ones with some horses.